This is Duke University. This afternoon, and this really is a very special treat. Uh, <coughs> Professor uh, John Fabian Witt from Yale has written probably what I found to be the most insightful book on the laws of war as they developed in the United States that I've ever seen. And I've spent some considerable time looking for such books. And uh, this is a subject I thought I knew quite a bit about, but believe me, there is, there is uh, stuff in the book that I had, hadn't known about. And he really takes an interesting perspective on how he weaves it all together. And the important thing that I found about this book and what I really admire is that it's not just a history. It's an accessible history. And for any time a lawyer can write something that is both uh, intellectually valid but also accessible, especially to the wider, wider audience, that does a service not just to you know, the academics and so forth and the specialists, but really to that larger audience. And it, what's interesting is some of you know in the Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions, it calls upon the state parties, of which the US isn't, but it does call upon the state parties to educate the public about the laws of war. And this book is, um, is the step towards doing that. And not as too much of an endorsement, but I'm personally buying seven or eight copies. <laughs> <laughs> and he has kindly agreed to autograph them. So if you're on my Christmas list, take a hard look here. San don't, don't be surprised if Santa puts that in your stocking. But in, in addition to that, um, and there will, by the way, uh, be books available afterwards uh, if, you're, if you're interested. And Professor Witt has kindly agreed to stay around and, and autograph them for you. Let me tell you a little bit about his background. He's a professor at law at Yale Law School. But like so many of the young professors, and from my perspective, he's a young pro professor, not only does he, he went to Yale undergrad, but he got his PhD from Yale and his JD from Yale. So this is the new breed of professor that has both the PhD and the JD. I'm glad I am as old as I am because that, that is really very impressive. This is not the first book he's written and not the first history book he's written. Uh, he's written a, a number of other, uh, The Accidental uh, Republic, which was a uh, prize-winning book published by Harvard University Press. He's had numerous articles. Uh, when you Google him, you'll come up with quite a few uh, of his articles in, in the Harvard Law Review, the Yale Law Journal, New York Times, Slate, and many other general interest publications, which I also think is an important part of what your work is, reaching out to that popular audience to educate them on, on the law. In 2010, he was awarded a Guggenheim uh, Fellowship the project to write this particular book. And, um, and he's, and before returning to Yale, he was the George Whit Wellwood Murray Professor of Legal History at Columbia University. And he clerked for uh, Judge Lavelle of the Second Circuit. And he has some other interesting things in his background. I hope you, you share some of those, some of those things. Because it's, I think when you, when you look at a book of this much gravity and, and, uh, and interest and so forth, it's always interesting to know what motivated the author to look at this. Because his, one of his main areas, especially at Yale, is tort law. And what I think is so great when you take someone whose focus is on that, they can come and look at something like the development of the laws of war with a fresh eye and without the baggage <laughs> that some of us, the rest of us may bring to this particular aspect of the discipline. So, it's a great pleasure. Allow me to introduce uh, Professor Witt, and let's give him a, a warm applause. That was a, a really wonderful uh, introduction, Charlie. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm really glad to, uh, to get to talk to you today uh, about uh, Lincoln's Code. Can everybody hear me? My, my, um, so, so this book, it starts, well, it, it, um, it starts with a puzzle and a story. Uh, and the story is about December 1862, when a college professor starts writing a text uh, in Washington, D.C. first, and then back in New York City. 
a text that purports to set out the rules of warfare. Uh, and he, he's a megalomaniacal, incredibly hardworking, uh, passionate, troubled man named Francis Liebert, who's a professor at Columbia College. And this text that he produces will, in uh, April and May of 1863, be issued as the restatement of the laws of war for the Union armies. Uh, and then in the immediate aftermath of the war, it'll be translated into German, French, Spanish, Italian. Uh, it'll become the basis for the Brussels Declaration in 1874, which is one of the first great efforts to restate the, the customary laws of war in Europe. It'll become the basis for the Hague Convention uh, in 1899, and again in 1907. And traces of it are still evident in the Geneva Conventions of 1949. Uh, so the, the puzzle that arises out of this story is what business did the Union have in December of 1862, at just the moment when the Lincoln administration has decided to step up the aggressiveness of the war campaign, to throw off the Rosewater, Lincoln's words, Rosewater strategy of the war's first year and a half and become much more aggressive and to endorse emancipation uh, uh, in the same moment. What business does the Union have at that moment to issue a statement of the laws of war? The laws of war usually come about in the aftermath of conflicts. 1949 is the perfect example with the Geneva Conventions following hard on the heels of World War II, but the Brussels Declaration follows immediately on the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, the uh, um, Hague Convention of 1899 follows as the American uh, delegates thought hard on the heels of the Spanish-American War uh, that it started in 1898. So what's going on with a, a, a country about to launch a much more aggressive strategy uh, and during the war issuing a set of, of, of rules? So that's the, the puzzle that I started the project with. Uh, and the answer that I've come to um, uh, is, um, uh, is one that I think has been hiding in plain view for 150 years. Uh, and the answer is rooted uh, in the experience and the imperatives of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the story that I try to tell in this book is the story about how emancipation uh, drove a restatement of the laws of war uh, and helped to transform the modern uh, rules of war as, as we know them. The, uh, the story really goes back as far as 1775. So in 1775, the last bro royal British governor, uh, the last British royal governor of Virginia, uh, Lord Dunmore, issues a proclamation announcing that he'll free any slaves who come behind British lines to help fight against the rebels, their masters. This sets off uh, a terror and anger and fury among Virginia slaveholders. Uh, and in that moment in 1775 begins an American tradition, an American tradition that will last for 80, uh, 80 years thereafter, which is a tradition of announcing that a cardinal rule of civilized warfare is that belligerents don't free enemy slaves in wartime. There were a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, one reason uh, uh, is an idea that private property ought not be attacked uh, in wartime. It's an articulation of the rule of distinction. And this is a, an idea that American jurists in the early 19th century will be at the cutting edge of articulating as compared to their European counterparts. But there's a, a second dimension, too. It's not just a, a principle about separating battlefield from plantation or battlefield from, from, from cotton field. Uh, it's also a principle about what might happen in the wake of slave emancipations. Uh, uh, Jefferson is worried about this in the Declaration when he uh, cites the king's raising uh, uh, of, of domestic enemies against the, uh, against the colonists. Uh, and the threat of domestic insurrections. And the fear here, and it goes back to antiquity, is that slave insurrections are especially dangerous kinds of wars. And that freeing an enemy slaves will be to set off, the, and the, the phrase here gets used over and over again from the late 18th century through into the Civil War. The phrase is the risk of servile insurrection. And servile insurrections are thought to have been wars that went to the very heart of the social structure uh, that risked terrible violence and mayhem uh, and this terror of domestic insurrection races through the American southern countryside uh, during the War of Independence. It recurs in the War of 1812 uh, and is a persistent theme throughout the antebellum period, both among white slave owners who are worried about it. You know, one of the central justifications for slavery was the idea that slaves were prisoners who'd been captured in war at a moment when war allowed the execution of prisoners, and so perforce also allowed the lesser included move <coughs> 
of enslaving the prisoner rather than executing him. So that, that idea suggests that the very idea of slavery was an idea of suppressed warfare on the plantation. The slaves were, in some sense, prisoners of war and their, uh, and their descendants. They were enemies uh, in, inside, the, uh, uh, inside the republic. And the worry was that warfare, hot warfare, might uh, uh, release that suppressed condition of warfare and turn the plantation uh, into, uh, into a battlefield. We can see this most clearly in John Quincy Adams, uh, the, the young John Quincy Adams, who in the Treaty of Ghent, and then for a decade and a half afterwards, uh, insists to the British that they've illegally carried away slaves during the War of 1812. One of the, my favorite parts of doing the research for this book was um, I was looking at southern newspapers during the War of 1812. I wanted to find evidence of this problem of slaves uh, being carried off by British raiding parties. And they were all through the Chesapeake and in, in, in Georgia along the coastline. Slaves were uh, guides and um, uh, uh, helped British raiding parties find their way through the byways and channels and roads of the countryside. Uh, and so I thought I'd find in newspapers some discussion of this, but I, but I didn't. What I found instead were advertisements and editorial notices announcing that British officers were making off with American slaves and cruelly selling them into worse bondage in the West Indies. And I found a lot of these. I kept finding them over and over again. And I came to think that they were just lies. They were manufactured stories by slave, owner and a sl slave owners and a slave owner class, worried that slaves, notwithstanding some bans already on slave literacy and slaves learning to read, were nonetheless reading the newspapers and so could be discouraged from running off with the British raiding parties if they were led to think that British raiding parties might be more dangerous than staying in the slavery that they knew already. Uh, if we look at the private correspondence of Southern slaveholders during, especially in the Chesapeake, Virginia, Maryland, during the War of 1812, we see a very different story. We see a story of, of people in terror that British raiding parties will race off with their slaves, and worse yet, they may stir their slaves up to uh, insurrections on the plantations. Uh, this, this idea lasts throughout the antebellum period, such that in 1861 and 62, it's one of the central problems that the Lincoln administration is up against, especially in the summer of 62, as Lincoln starts to think about whether or not to move to emancipation. We can see this idea even in Lincoln himself. So in, in uh, the late summer of 1861, John Fremont, the impetuous, handsome, but politically clumsy uh, 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 Union commander in Missouri, announces emancipation. Uh, and Lincoln rebukes him and, and revokes the order. Uh, and he revokes the order on the ground that mil military necessity, which is to say the warrant of the law of war, doesn't authorize emancipation. Now, already by the spring of 1862, Lincoln's adopting somewhat of a different view. David Hunter does the same thing uh, as the commander of the Department of the South. And now Lincoln's rebuke is a different one. Now his view is that if anyone is to emancipate the slaves, it's not going to be Hunter or a commander in the field. It's going to be Lincoln who makes the decision. And by the summer of 1862, Lincoln's uh, uh, come full uh, circle and has concluded that emancipation uh, is the way forward if he wants to restore the Union. But in doing this, he raises a, a problem. He raises the problem that you're now familiar with, which is that for 80 plus years, American statesmen and soldiers have been committed to the view this was unlawful in wartime. Uh, it's that circumstance that produces the text uh, uh, that comes to be known as the, uh, as the Libra Code. So in early December of 1862, uh, just after the administrations finished the huge amount of effort required to send Congress its annual message, uh, Halleck and Stanton together decide to commission a text that will restate the laws of the war. And they turn to Francis Lieber, who, for a variety of interesting reasons, is the person who's come to their attention as the, as the most authoritative uh, 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 expert on law of war questions. Lieber himself is uh, somewhat famously a, a, an amazing Forrest Gump-like character. I used to think that I could say Zelig-like character. And then I realized my audiences didn't get the Zelig-like reference. So I moved to Forrest Gump, but my audiences don't get that anymore <laughs> either. So take it, it's a person who moves through history and sort of encounters lots of different things. Um, and Lieber is that kind of person. So uh, Lieber is born in Prussia in 1798. He watches Napoleon march through Berlin in 1806. 
uh, and then with a whole generation of Prussians, organizes his uh, uh, boyhood and young adulthood around the project of getting rid of the, the yoke of Napoleon. Fights at Waterloo, is injured while chasing Napoleon back to Paris, and left for dead on a, on a, uh, on a Belgian battlefield. Uh, in the Civil War, he's, he comes to the United States in 1827. He's a political suspect in uh, reactionary Metternich uh, Europe. Uh, in the United States, becomes a, a public intellectual of sorts and teaches for 20 years at the College of South Carolina, now the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, and then in 1856-57, moves north to New York and to Columbia College. Uh, in the Civil War itself, he has sons on both sides of the, on both sides of the conflict. Uh, what his oldest son is essentially raised in South Carolina and stays in South Carolina and is a, a bitter enemy of his father's decision to move north and to vote for Lincoln in 1860. Uh, and then his two younger sons fight on the, uh, on the Union side. Uh, so Lieber is, is a, a, a fascinating character to turn to in December of 1862. Uh, and one of the reasons the uh, Union administration turns to him is that he'd become well known for a set of ferocious views, and I, I choose that word carefully, ferocious views on, on <coughs> warfare in civilized societies. So Lieber was someone who believed uh, intensely that civilization required regular bouts of warfare, that societies that lacked regular recurrences of warfare inevitably declined into luxury and vice, uh, and that the martial spirit was the way to maintain the virtue of a, of a civilized republic. Uh, and so Lieber is someone you can turn to in December 1862 who won't produce a code of war that will tie the Union's hands behind its back at just the moment when it wants to uh, engage in a much more aggressive form of warfare. Lieber's particular views are um, abundantly evident in the text of the code itself, which is organized almost exclusively around the idea of military necessity. Lieber's notion was that Anything uh, that was necessary, any form of any course of conduct that was necessary to advance a legitimate war aim, was a course of conduct that was permitted uh, under the laws of war. Most of the rules that he articulates have a necessity carve out, uh, and that is the the way that Lieber organizes the uh, the laws of war in, in the text that he produces. Now, this is a striking feature of the text because it cuts against the 18th century structure of the laws of war. Uh, the 18th century jurists, people like Emmerich de Vatel, a Swiss jurist uh, who writes beautifully and so becomes uh, an influential uh, 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 member of, the, uh, of the, the group of publicists who are creating international law or the law of nations in the 18th century. Vatel's effort is to create moral symmetry between, the two, between two or more belligerents, to set aside the question of who's right and who's wrong in the conflict, and then to use that moral symmetry so as to be able to deduce crystallize a whole series of hard and fast rules, things that you cannot do without regard to circumstance. Vattel's concern was that if reference was allowable to circumstance, circumstance would inevitably include the aims of the war. And if the aims of the war were admitted to the calculus of what one could do and what one couldn't, then inevitably war would spiral down into, into a miserable internecine conflict. Each side would imagine that it was licensed to do more than the other. Its uh, observation of the other side doing more than it thought the other side was permitted to do would produce retaliation, which would in turn produce counter-retaliation. Lieber moves away from the hard and fast rules. He moves away from the strict moral symmetry of the parties. Uh, and by adopting the military necessity test is in some ways a throwback to earlier forms of just war uh, thinking in medieval and early modern Catholic thought. Uh, that military necessity test is especially important because one of its central contributions is to share with Lincoln the justification for emancipation. Military necessity being the, one of the central sources of authority that Lincoln cites in issuing his Emancipation Proclamation, first announcing it in September of 1862 and then finalizing it on January 1st of 1863. The, the text itself, in addition to this military necessity principle, uh, uh, adopts no fewer than 10 of its 157 articles, more articles than are dedicated to torture or prisoners of war or paroles or exchanges, adopts 10 articles that are organized around two problems arising out of emancipation. One is the legality of emancipation itself, uh, and the second is the problem of black soldiers as prisoners of war. I'll say a couple things about these two, um, 
these two problems. Uh, when Lincoln announces emancipation on September 22nd, 1862, uh, reaction in the South uh, is, is uh, uh, predictably angry uh, and outraged. Um, people like Jefferson Davis and James Seddon, Seddon is the Secretary of War, talk in terms of the barbarism of this, uh, of, of this uh, move to emancipation. And barbarism is, in the 19th century, a term of art in the laws of war. They're accusing Lincoln of throwing off the civilized constraints that Western states have recognized for a century and a half at that point. And they're accusing him of engaging in a form of, of unconstrained warfare. Um, uh, moreover, hand in hand with emancipation comes the arming of, of, black, uh, of blacks, free blacks in the North, uh, and then former slaves from the South. And this is something that the administration moves to, especially after August of 1862. Uh, Davis and Seddon view black soldiers as criminals, not entitled to the privileges of prisoner of war status. Uh, black soldiers cannot, for racial reasons, be legitimate soldiers on the view of Davis uh, and Seddon. And moreover, those black soldiers who were once slaves, and in the South's view still are slaves, since they think the Emancipation Proclamation is unlawful, well, they're essentially slaves engaged in an insurrection. Free blacks from the North are stirring up slave insurrection, and their white officers, the white officers of these black regiments, are doing the same. The black prisoner of war problem is a huge problem. In the fall of 1862 and into the spring of 1863, the Union has concluded that it needs strategically to be able to make recourse to uh, uh, black men as part of the Union Army. Um, uh, and free blacks in the North, people like Frederick Douglass, are making clear that unless the Union stands up for black soldiers, well, free blacks, people like Martin Delaney and, and Douglas himself, won't be willing to recruit aggressively among the, black, uh, among the black population in the North. So what the code does is announce that Union armies are like roving embassies of freedom. Uh, when uh, when, when uh, slaves cross over uh, into uh, Union lines, they instantly become free, is the view, the legal view that Lieber adopts. And Lieber also adopts the view that uh, it's the uniform that makes the privileged soldier. That race is irrelevant to the question of whether or not a, a man is a legitimate combatant or merely a criminal. Uh, and 10 of the articles in the code are organized around this, this, uh, uh, these set of problems. Now, it's striking because these are the 10 articles that have no precedent in any other 19th, 18th, 17th century uh, uh, law book or law text on the walls of war. These are the truly original uh, uh, provisions of the, of the code. And one of the great um, uh, uh, geeky pleasures of this project is that in the Huntington Library in California, uh, we have the committee prints of the, tech, uh, of the code, and we have the editing history. We know what Henry Alec told Lieber should be changed. Uh, we know what Lieber's correspondents, the people he sent committee prints to all around the country, we know what they told him uh, uh, they thought about the code. And almost all of that engagement, with one exception we can get into later, but almost all that engagement is over the slavery sections. Everyone in, in the room knew what was at stake, and that the slavery sections were the most controversial uh, and, and, the most, and the most delicate. This is true for a whole bunch of reasons. One is it, it's, it's, the, it's the elephant in the room in late 1862 and early 1863. It also had, interestingly, <coughs> to me at any rate, a, a transatlantic audience in mind. One of the things the Emancipation Proclamation is designed to do is put the British and the French to their principles. Uh, uh, the British and the French having uh, come out for, uh, as, as anti-slavery for decades uh, at this point. Um, the idea is to hold off British or French intervention into the war. There's lots of internal pressure in both uh, uh, Great Britain and France because cotton manufacturers in both countries rely on uh, cotton from the American South, cotton that's not available, at least in anything close to the quantities it had been before the war, once the Union blockade gets, gets set up. Um, uh, the problem with appealing to the British and the French with this emancipation idea is the British and the French well, know, know full well about the long history of servile insurrections and, and uh, uh, anxieties of terrible nightmarish uh, atrocities that might ensue upon emancipation. And so the very act of emancipation produces a counter push by uh, supporters in, Brit in Britain and France of intervening uh, to intervene now more than ever on the idea that now Britain and France can rescue uh, uh, the United States from a humanitarian atrocity of, uh, of colossal proportions. 
So what does the, the, the code aim to do? Well, it aims to, to assure audiences north and south and across the Atlantic that the United States has not committed itself to a barbaric strategy that views as irrelevant constraints on warfare. That to the contrary, the United States is at this moment doubling down on its uh, commitments to uh, uh, take into account rules and constraints uh, in, in war. Now, the code itself is issued in uh, um, April, although really only made uh, public in mid-May of 1863. It produces uh, further angry reactions uh, from the South. Um, and, and one of the most striking features of the research that I did was seeing how little Civil War historians have paid attention uh, to this text. It is viewed as either irrelevant and not worth discussing. That's the view that James McPherson takes for the most part, especially in Battle Cry of Freedom, no doubt the best-selling book on the history of the Civil War in our, in our time, uh, or as a, as a charade, a sham, which is a view that uh, the historians who usually take it up, who do take it up, usually adopt. And historians oftentimes look to things like uh, Sherman's March to the Sea, uh, or the fact of stepped-up Union destruction of Southern property, uh, as, as evidence for the irrelevance of this, of this document. And I've come to think uh, that this is a mistake, that the text of the document actually does matter. It matters, though, in ways that are different from the ways we might expect from 20th or 21st century perspectives. Uh, in, in a way, one of, the, one of the things I've come to think uh, after uh, finishing this book uh, is that every generation of Americans, you know, back to the War of Independence, back to the Seven Years' War uh, in the 1750s and 1760s, every generation of Americans has had a law of war crisis. I mean, many generations have had more than one law of war crisis. We may be one of those generations. Uh, but they, all, they often show up in ways that are difficult to discern, uh, given the kinds of problems that uh, constitute the crises that we have. Uh, and so here's a, here's a good example in the Civil War. This law of war text does play a, a big role on the ground, but just not in the ways that we expect it to. So what does is, what is the uh, text of the code do? Um, one really important feature of the code is to organize a blueprint for military commissions. Uh, the Articles of War, which go back uh, you know, deep into British history and then are adopted in 1775 uh, by the Continental Congress, and then uh, re-articulated in 1806 by the United States Congress, uh, the Articles of War create the court-martial and set out a set of enumerated <coughs> rules uh, to govern US, uh, uh, mostly, although not exclusively, uh, members of the US Armed Forces. Uh, the problem for the Union, uh, and this becomes especially clear in places like Missouri, where there's a lot of unorganized fighting involving partisan and guerrilla fighters, the problem is that many of the, of the uh, uh, people the Union would like to try don't fall into the obvious categories set up by the Articles of War, and they may be people over whom the courts martial don't have any jurisdiction. And so the military commission is something that was first pioneered by Winfield Scott in Mexico in 1847, 1848, and then is picked up in the American Civil War. The problem is that nobody knows what it is. And by nobody, I mean the commanders in the field don't know how to operate these things. They don't come with off the rack rules like the courts martial do. Uh, and so one of the central aims uh, for Lieber is to create a blueprint for these military commissions. Lieber's middle son, uh, Norman Lieber, is a judge advocate uh, at just this time. And in fact, this is just the time when the judge advocate general uh, has been, uh, this is September 62, uh, the Judge Advocate General uh, is created as a, as a position, uh, and the Judge Advocate General's office is being staffed with the best and brightest uh, and most and best connected lawyers uh, from the younger generation in the North, including, including uh, uh, Lieber's own son. So the military commissions uh, are, are central contributions of the, uh, of the Lieber text. And one of the things I was, I was uh, interested to be able to find uh, during the course of my archival work is, is I think I've been able to generate an estimate of the number of military commissions charging law of war violations in the Civil War. It's something we weren't able to do before, uh, uh, largely because of the disorganization of the, of the uh, records in the National Archives. Uh, but it, it seems pretty clear to me now that there are almost a thousand military commissions in which the charges were violation, included violation of the laws of war. Uh, and those, those military commissions are organized around the blueprint that uh, Lieber helps to create. He corresponds with the Judge Advocate General on hard cases and uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, expert consultant on, on these things. So that's a really important feature of what the Lieber Code does. A second uh, important feature is, is playing a role in the ongoing 
story of black POWs uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the war. Um, the, uh, the South doesn't retreat from its position that black soldiers and their white officers are criminals, not soldiers. Uh, and this becomes a sticking point uh, in the process of prisoner exchange that the Union and the South had engaged in for the first year and a half of the war. One thing that international lawyers have liked to say about Lieber's text uh, I'd be interested to talk at the end maybe why, why it's called Lieber's Code and why I've renamed it in the title of my book. Is we can have a conversation about that. But, but in, insofar as international lawyers have talked about and thought about Lieber's text, um, uh, they've been tempted to tell a story of progress over time. A story of progress over time in which Lieber's text is one of the great humanitarian steps forward leading to Brussels, to The Hague, to Geneva, uh, and to contemporary IHL. Uh, and the view they adopt is that the Lieber Code may have done more or less during the Civil War, but it was able to make some humanitarian progress. It marked out, for example, rules about prisoners of war. And so it's a, it's a step for humanitarianism in the war. I've come to think that this has it almost entirely backward, even in its modest version. Uh, and the reason has to do with what the Lieber Code does for the POW problem in, in the Civil War. Uh, the Lieber Code makes a strike for justice and for doing the right thing, for backing up black prisoners of war by insisting that they do count as prisoners of war and that they must be included in prisoner exchanges. When the South refuses to include black soldiers in prisoner exchanges, the prisoner exchanges break down. The populations of prison camps north and south shoot up, and we get the nightmarish stories that we know as Andersonville in Georgia or Elmira uh, in New York, which wasn't quite as bad as Andersonville, he says to this North Carolina audience. But, um, uh, but, but nonetheless, it's a pretty miserable place to be. Uh, now, why are the, it's a, these are there are populations in these camps that are simply unanticipated by the creators of the camp, and completely, and, and, and neither side is able to to um, provide the kinds of medical care and and nutrition that uh, the, th the tens of thousands of prisoners uh, accumulating south and north uh, require. Um, so, what's going on here? The code, by bolstering a really unpopular union position bolstering the decision not to uh, engage in prisoner exchanges on behalf of black soldiers. Uh, the code is, is participating in the humanitarian nightmare that is the, uh, uh, is the prison camps, which is not to say that it's the wrong thing. To the contrary, this is an example of what I, I'd like to see throughout the book, which is an ongoing tension between the imperatives of justice on the one hand, that is, that is accomplishing the end of the conflict uh, which, after all, is a, an end of great import, no matter what that end happens to be, because it's an end one's been willing to go to war for. Uh, and on the other hand, the imperatives of humility and humanity, that is recognizing constraints internal to the conflict that one has decided is worth going to war uh, to win. Um, the, uh, uh, the prisoner of war policy was hugely unpopular in the North. Um, uh, white families couldn't figure out why it was that their sons and fathers should molder in prison camps uh, while uh, merely, on the, uh, uh, merely on behalf, in their view, uh, uh, merely on behalf of a relatively small number of black soldiers. Uh, people like Walt Whitman, writing in the New York newspapers, thought that this policy was a scandal. Uh, and, and interestingly, white uh, prisoners in places like Andersonville couldn't understand it, partly because they saw their, uh, their black peers separated out from the camps. Since the South's position was that black prisoners were not prisoners of war, but were criminals, they didn't get put in places like Andersonville for the most part. Uh, and so some of them, in, in, in a funny irony, some of the worst humanitarian dimensions of the prison camps were uh, experiences that some black prisoners were spared. Now, Many black prisoners were simply executed, uh, 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 executed uh, uh, summarily in the field. One of the effects of the code is to cause the South to pull back from its public position of promising criminal trials for black soldiers. And one of the substitutes is the summary execution. There's interesting correspondence in, in the, um, uh, among the Southern officers um, uh, um, uh, over episodes in which one Southern officer will simply say, uh, well, all of our black prisoners tried to escape, and so they were all shot. And there's a wink, wink, nod, nod, and everyone understands exactly what's, what's happened. So, the, um, uh, so here's the, the funny thing about the code then. Uh, um, uh, the code articulates a view that is committed in its military necessity idea and in 
and in its commitment to the uh, importance of justice for black soldiers, it articulates a view that is dangerous to humanitarianism, uh, even as it uh, articulates some limited constraints on what uh, one side can do to another uh, in war. Um, now, Charlie, how, how late do we go? What's, what's, I don't know. One fifteen. So, so I'd love to hear questions, but may I say one, one last thing. One puzzle that remains for me, um, uh, although I have, a, I have a theory of it, which I wrote here, so you know, but, but uh, I, I'm, I'll be puzzled about most of these things for a long time. Uh, one puzzle is, what, how is it that the Libra Code makes a difference in, uh, uh, in Europe? One thing that, that uh, 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 sophisticated readers uh, and people I've talked to in the course of writing the book for years now uh, say is, well, wait, there's just there's something in the air. Uh, in, in 1859, a guy goes to a battlefield in Solferino in Italy, sees massacres, and sees wounded and sick soldiers on the field. And so the International Committee of the Red Cross is created. 1864 is the first Geneva Convention. Uh, and actually, if we, if we look more carefully, there are charismatic reformers, people like Florence Nightingale in England, charismatic reformers in all European countries in the late 1850s into the 1860s, who are starting to think about humanitarianism in war. And so what, if anything, is distinctive to the American experience? Isn't it just an American preoccupation to focus on the Libra Code, since it comes out of our experience? Uh, uh, I've come to think that there's, there's something importantly distinctive about the Libra Code that, in a, that has a causal influence. Uh, on the developments in Europe uh, in the second half of the 19th century. And the problem goes like this. Uh, the debates among European states and you know, proto-NGOs, the ICRC, uh, in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s are at a complete impasse. And the problem is that the Geneva Convention, the first Geneva Convention, has picked off a problem as to which there aren't very high strategic stakes. It's the sick and the wounded on the field. That is to say, people who are no longer resources in the advancement of the strategic ends of the uh, uh, competing European powers. But every time anybody makes a new proposal, a more ambitious proposal, let's say, for example, the hot button issue, to decide who's a legitimate combatant and who's not, everyone at the table knows that this is a project, the rules to which are going to decide in the strategic interests of one side or the other. The Prussians are worried that when the Tsar makes a, a proposal, that the Tsar is just running out of money and is looking for a way to stop arms races from uh, driving him further into bankruptcy. The Belgians know that every time the Prussians make a, a proposal, that it's really a proposal designed to make it easier to occupy Belgium. And it usually is such a proposal, <laughs> and they usually do occupy Belgium. Uh, a, you know, and, but vice versa, too. The, Prussian, the, the strong military uh, 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 leaders of Prussia uh, have no interest in rules that are uh, pushing a Belgian uh, agenda. And moreover, they're suspicious, uh, and this is true of, of military leaders uh, across Europe, they're suspicious that, that the, the, the laws of war are really a peacenik project, that the ICRC is a group of secret pacifists who would begin here, but are really engaged in a much bigger effort to bring an end to war uh, altogether. Now, Think of what the lincoln Lieber text does. First of all, it, it's not a part of any secret strategy inside European rivalries. It comes orthogonally to the long-standing European impasse. And this is why European uh, delegates to conferences in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s cite the Lieber Code over and over again. It's a way of credibly committing to not being just someone pushing some secret strategy uh, uh, for, uh, uh, designed to advance the interests of one state. M moreover, by pushing the, the Lincoln Code, and the delegates are smart enough to start talking about Lincoln in these, uh, uh, in these uh, 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 conventions, in the treaty negotiations. And by pushing the Lincoln Code, they're obviously not trying to hit, tie anyone's hands behind their backs. The Lincoln Code is a code designed in December of 1862, at just the moment when the Lincoln administration wants to launch a much more aggressive campaign. It's a code with which the Lincoln administration does win a war, uh, and, and does so without any ill effects, apparently. From, uh, from the constraints of the laws of war. So the, the, the Lieber-Lincoln text is perfectly designed to solve the particular diplomatic problem that European rivalries have created in the latter part of the 19th century. Now, whether, um, uh, you know, whether we get a fourth Geneva Convention, in uh, 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 1949, Geneva series of Geneva Conventions, with or without this causal story, now that's an interesting question. Maybe above my pay grade. 
but 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 the, the story of how we get from 1862 to 1899, 1907, and those are important landmarks in the road to 1949, is a story that I think can't be understood without the causal significance of, uh, of Lieber, Lincoln, and his text. One last thought, why the Lincoln, why, why Lincoln's code rather than Lieber's code? Since international lawyers have talked about this as Li uh, Lieber's code, um, uh, you know, for, for a century and more, partly because of Lieber's own uh, um, uh, propaganda campaign. That is, he, he, he um, Lieber imagines that we today will talk about uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, John Stuart Mill, and Francis Lieber, representing the, the, the British, the French, and the German influences to uh, European civilization in the 19th century. It, it didn't work out quite that way for him, uh, but he's engaged in a, a self-promotion effort to try his very best to see that it will. And that's certainly one reason uh, why we've come to think of this as Lieber's Code. But I think the more important reason, though, is that to attach the code to Lincoln is to raise all of the ambiguities and contradictions and problems that we started to talk about here uh, uh, at, this, at this lunchtime. Uh, to attach it to Lincoln is to attach it self-consciously to the person who helps to remake modern warfare, the person who is in charge, ostensibly, of Sherman's March to the Sea, uh, to the person who's identified with the kinds of warfare that we'll come to know in the trenches of World War I and then in the aerial bombardments of World War II. So that the Lincoln Code doesn't work if the project is to identify the laws of war as a great step forward for humanitarianism in wartime. Now, this international lawyer named Francis Lieber, who's not a part of the Union uh, uh, command structure, now he's a much more appealing person to attach the, the text of the code to. He's not a tarred by association uh, with the politically controversial uh, project of engaging in the Union war effort. Uh, so that's why it's Lincoln's code. I'm happy to, to talk more or uh, hear questions. Um, how do you want to, should, should I call people, Char, or you want to? Yeah. Let's go with the student first. I was wondering if you could, excuse me, um, elaborate a little more on maybe exactly what Lieber was talking about with his necessity clause. Um, I mean, with specific regards to total war, um, it seems like you can make a very convincing argument that that was a military necessity to uh, decimate the South, uh, specifically in that example, to decimate the South's uh, ability to you know, sustain an army. Um, but then again, you say many historians view this as sham because it kind of goes against the humanitarian nature. So what exactly was the scope of his military necessity? You know, with, I'll leave it at that. That's good. So this is a great question. I mean, uh, uh, I, I've come to think that, that Lieber's text doesn't, does, that doesn't purport to bar anything that Sherman orders on the march to the sea. Now, there's lots of stuff that happens that Sherman doesn't order, and there's a controversy about the extent to which Sherman was, was winking and nodding at that conduct. Um, uh, but, but, and Lieber himself is actually very worried about that. Uh, one of Lieber's, Lieber's idea that wars are renewing to civilization uh, is, is linked closely to an idea that, that armies need to be disciplined uh, and need to be organized in ways that uh, have constraints, not necessarily humanitarian constraints exerted by third parties or by some ideal, but rather by their commanders. That is, an organized army with an organized state doesn't run amok and do things that aren't in the interests of advancing the commander's orders. Now, Sherman's March to the Sea involves lots and lots of, you know, famously, Sherman's bummers are the stragglers who uh, uh, run amok uh, and, and produce um, uh, uh, mayhem to the sea. Uh, so Lieber's very worried about Sherman's bummers, uh, and he has active correspondence about this, about this problem. But the kinds of uh, efforts to destroy civilian infrastructure when it's necessary to advance the legitimate war end, Lieber is perfectly okay with. And in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, explicitly approves it uh, in the text of the, um, of the code. So military necessity is a very broad warrant. Now one of the questions is, what about the few things that Lieber pulls out of military necessity, for which he retains a hard and fast Vitellian, in the story I'm telling here, uh, rule, that regardless of circumstance, because the military necessity is always contingent on circumstance. That is, the question is just, what, is, what are the circumstances, uh, uh, and, and, and does a necessity warrant it under these circumstances? And those circumstances include the legitimate end and its weightiness, or lack thereof. But there's, there, there are a couple hard and fast things that Lieber pulls out. Torture is the most, is the most striking. Uh, so Lieber has a no torture under any circumstances rule. He doesn't write it very well, and so it's really only across two sections that you can put it together and see that it really is a no torture under any circumstances rule, but it's there in, in the text. 
Um, we know from his law lectures at Columbia, which he gives in 1861-62, that he really doesn't like these hard and fast rules. In fact, in his law lectures, he insists that there can be no hard and fast rule against poison. The, use, the widespread use of poison uh, uh, by, by an army, because he can imagine circumstances. He imagines a small republic up against a powerful state where poison might be appropriate. Now, in the, the text of the code itself, there's a hard and fast rule against poison. I think he, he experiences himself there as being pressured into adopting a more mainstream view. His, his is an eccentric view on poison that he, he shares in his lectures. But torture, he has a hard and fast rule on in his lectures too. And so what's going on with the torture rule? Um, uh, you know, I have two, two theories built on the kinds of the reasons that he gives for the torture rule. Um, and one is the standard of reciprocity, which is one of the standard uh, uh, rationales for the, the torture rule in contemporary IHL. Uh, what we do to the other side, the other side will do to us. And so the laws of war can create a, bunch, a series of focal points or benchmarks that will allow us to coordinate our behavior with the, uh, with the other side. But the other is he's worried about the demoralizing, this is Sherman's bones again, the demoralizing consequences of torturing for the torturer himself. Uh, that this is the kind of thing that produces <laughs> downward spirals from civilized stateness to uh, a barbaric uh, disaster. So that, that's a little bit about military necessity. Hey John, uh, as you know, there's, a, there's this ongoing debate in international law more generally about the extent, if at all, that it actually constrains states from doing things that they would like to do or whether it's just kind of epiphenomenal based on their power and their interests, things like that. Yeah. And uh, in reading your history, I, you know, two things, themes that really struck me were, one, the idea that the United States throughout the 19th century just kept redefining the laws of war based on military necessity and its position in the world, all the way up through the Spanish-American War and torturing people in the Philippines. And, sometime, and then the hopeful part of your narrative was something like, we do see sides pulling back from the worst excesses, but primarily to avoid a downward kind of spiral. You're just talking about torture. Um, clearly a reciprocity kind of an orientation. Neither of those stories are particularly about international law operating as some kind of exogenous constraint on states. And neither one works particularly well if you want a story of stopping the Bush administration or something from doing things you don't like, or Obama administration from predator, using predator drones or something you don't like. Um, is that your take as well from the history that it's uh, more a pro international law is more a product as opposed to a constraint? Or what are you? Yeah, this is, this is great. This is um, I, uh, I very much wanted the book to provide you know a fodder for for this debate, and I wanted to, uh, uh, it to to you know, provide new ways into the into the uh, into the argument, and I also wanted to take a view on the on the question. I was very pleased uh, when Eric Posner reviewed it that he said he later denied this in the same review, but he says you know that I showed that law mattered in this. I mean that for Eric Posner that's a huge victory. I don't, I don't know. I mean that's like I mean I could just go home then. I, I, but uh, um, so here so so it, the, the story in which so this is a story about the. The, the cultural work that the laws of war do. Um, uh, the ways in which I think they do, or did, and presumably still do, although I'm no 21st century expert, uh, the ways they did shape events on the ground. Now, oftentimes it was in unanticipated ways, perverse ways, uh, um, uh, ways that weren't, that weren't in the eye of Vattel in the 1750s. Take, for example, the prisoner of war camps uh, uh, north and south. Um, uh, and I also wouldn't ever want to make the claim rest on uh, an argument about exogenous influence. That is, the story I'm going to tell here is about one of you know, influence from the inside, endogenous influence, in which the laws of war help people accomplish, that, which is to say change the world, they're a tool in helping people accomplish certain ends, uh, um, and, and then help to reshape only partially, no doubt, those ends in feedback loops. So here's, here's the story that I like best for illustrating this um, uh, this this uh, this. Uh, conundrum. And it's the story of Lincoln in May of 1861 uh, with the blockade, April, May of 1861. So Lincoln's first move uh, is through Seward to go to the European Diplomatic Corps and say, listen, I know you like our cotton and everything, but we're going to shut down these ports as a way to win this war because we're the only side with an industrial base. And if we can shut down the ports, then the South can't get anything, we'll win the war. Um, the, South, uh, the, the European Diplomatic Corps goes apoplectic at the idea of what's being styled as port closure. Port closure is a criminal law domestic move. You know, um, uh, any country can close its own ports, uh, um, uh, unless you're an Asian country denying Europeans the right to trade with you. That's a complicated, <laughs> that's a complicated 19th century move. I require backflips that I'm not able to perform. Um, 
Nonetheless, you're allowed to close your ports. Um, uh, the problem is when you close your ports, those are your rules. Um, uh, you could make it a death penalty for going across the, 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 the line of the port. You could have any procedure you want. International law, circa 1861, has nothing to say about that. Uh, British uh, uh, diplomats and French diplomats are very aware they're already in a dicey diplomatic situation back home. Uh, and so the possibility that there should be cause celebs or martyrs to the cause of the cotton trade is a real problem. So the European uh, diplomatic corps says, proposes to Seward, and Seward takes them up on the Secretary of State. Uh, how about a blockade instead? The blockade is a set of international law rules. They're off the rack. The rack isn't just made by the United States. Uh, uh, there are a bunch of take, it, uh, uh, take them as you find them rules. They'll be transparent to the European audience, and they'll put limits on what the United States can do to seamen caught going across the, um, uh, going across the, uh, uh, the blockade lines. Uh, um, why is this a story about constraint? Well, the blockade is something you can only do in wartime. Now, if it's a war, then the South is a legitimate belligerent. And this is not what Lincoln wants to admit in April and May of 1861. Now, he's forced to go along with it. He, has no, he can't afford to lose the British and the French already in May of 1861. But when he goes along with it, it's not free. It's not free. It doesn't come with uh, something that he can just, he adopts what he calls, and this is using Sumner's language, uh, the mixed theory of the war. It's going to be partly criminal conspiracy and partly a war uh, as to which the laws of war will attach. Um, and so he's trying to adopt a flexible, easy, cheap talk strategy there, where he can say war when it's war and say crime, when it, when, when, say war when he has to or wants to, and say crime when he has to or wants to. Uh, but it turns out that it's not free. And this becomes clear in the, the piracy prosecutions that the Lincoln administration tries to bring later in that same year. Um, the piracy prosecutions turn on the idea that the South is not a country, not a legitimate belligerent, not entitled to be at war at all. Um, and the administration runs into huge problems with that. It runs into problems trying to sell that story to the same European diplomatic corps. It runs into problems trying to sell that story to the juries in Philadelphia and New York. And by January, February of 1862, it's had to abandon these piracy prosecutions altogether. So opting into the laws of war isn't just something you can toggle in and toggle out. It has entailments and consequences that don't bind in the sense of being an exogenous force, like a policeman on the beat who holds up the stop sign and makes you stop. It's rather, it commits you to a particular mode of discourse uh, from which extracting yourself is difficult. Another nice example is the post-war prosecutions of people like Jefferson Davis, which collapse. And one of the reasons they collapse is for four years, you've been treating Jefferson Davis as the leader of an enemy belligerent. Uh, and then to turn around and treat him as someone subject to a treason prosecution is to require the whole country to buy your reversal of story. And it turns out you can't, you just can't do that. You just can't do that. So, so um, uh, entailments and endogenous consequences, not exogenous constraint. Have a student. <laughs> okay. I mean, I have a... <laughs> yeah, so we call, I mean, historians generally call it Libra's Code, but he wasn't the only one who had written on uh, executive power and its relation to military necessity as far as uh, freeing slaves. But William Whiting, the solicitor of the War Department, and former Justice Benjamin Curtis. Is there any evidence that they tried to influence uh, what we now know as Libra's Code, or is there any evidence that he solicited or entertained uh, outside recommendations? As far as uh, as yes, so. Um, uh, he solicits outside advice from all sorts of people. Um, uh, never in my experience, either Whiting or Curtis. So I've been especially interested in Whiting as someone who should be connected here. Whiting writes an important pamphlet uh, in the midst of the war, uh, which touches on the question of the war power and emancipation. Now, Whiting's reputation is right now in, in a, uh, what could be a precipitous decline. So Mark Neely has this wonderful new book on the Constitution uh, uh, in, in the Civil War. And Neely is of the view that Whiting's not nearly as influential as Whiting would have us think. You know, Whiting starts putting on the front of the pamphlet 12th edition, but Neely can't find any editions between the 2nd and the, and the 11th. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so Whiting's kind of an interesting character. Um, uh, there's some reason to think from uh, uh, little bits here and there that he, he's, he's ill on a number of occasions during the course of the war, and so maybe just isn't able to uh, engage as a, 
uh, as carefully. So, so, but I've seen no Whiting Lieber correspondence. You know, the Lieber idea about emancipation in wartime, I mean, it has, it has pretty deep roots. I've told you the American State Department story from 1775 to, you know, let's say all the way to 1861 on slavery in wartime. Uh, but there's a counter story, which is an abolitionist story, which comes out of a strong reading of the Somerset case, which is an English case, uh, um, asking the question, what happens when a slave arrives on free soil? Um, and the strong abolitionist reading, which Paul Finkel will know better than I, but, but, but the strong abolition, abolitionist reading, which I, I think is a strong misreading of, of, what, uh, 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 of what Mansfield wants to do in the case, is that as soon as the slave touches on free soil, the slave is free. And that's exactly the view that Lieber adopts for the purposes of the, uh, of the code. So he's got a long tradition to work with, which is to say I don't think he needs these other... Um, other, uh, other systems. One last time. Lieber was a slave owner when he was in South Carolina. He owned uh, uh, slaves, so serial domestic uh, servants he owned as slaves. Um, uh, he purports in his new correspondence to people like Charles Sumner, his friend from uh, Massachusetts, to be anti-slavery, uh, but he owns slaves, and Sumner doesn't let him get off so easy. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if this counts as exogenous or endogenous, but I wonder how the American Indian Wars fit into the story, either as an influence on the yeah. code or yes. if they were influenced by the code, given they would have been ongoing in the 1860s, the Dakotas, yeah. and then afterwards the Sioux involving people like Custer and Sherman, mm -hmm. who were obviously veterans mm -hmm. of the Civil War. Does the right. proclamation prison that you use help explain that? Yes. Yeah, really interesting question. So I, got, I became totally fascinated with uh, Indian warfare both intra-Indian uh, warfare and warfare between European empire and, uh, and Indians um, you know, going back into the you know, uh, 16th century. Um, and, uh, and one of the challenges that I wanted to take on for the first half of the book, the first third, which is what Lincoln and Lieber were up against, uh, is the idea that warfare with Indians was warfare as to which there were no rules. Um, the rule laws were simply didn't apply in, in, the, standard, uh, in the standard narrative. And, and um, maybe because I'm not an international lawyer, uh, maybe because I'm more interested in the cultural work that this field of practice does, uh, it seems to me that the laws of war do all sorts of interesting and important work in the pre-Civil War Indian uh, warfare. For one thing, they help to mobilize the passions of American militias. You see, Andrew Jackson is the best example of this. Um, I mean, it, it's precisely Indian practices that don't comport with the European conventions that, that generate the moral vision of frontier warfare. Uh, so this is not a situation where the laws of war are irrelevant. They may not then set constraints. That is, Jackson may have a view about whether or not he can or can't engage in this practice now. Uh, but, but his moral approach to the conflict has been powerfully shaped by, by the laws of war. And then after the Civil War, there's a very interesting development which says something, is maybe good as a, a last question here. So it says, it, it gets at the alternately hopeful and really dark and dismal place that the book ends and where I want to leave, where I want to leave our sense of the history of the laws of war. So one of the striking features of the three decades after the Civil War is that all of a sudden the laws of war start getting discussed and applied in Indian conflicts. So these are the, 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 the last decades of, of Indian wars uh, out, out, out in the West. Um, all of a sudden we start having military commissions of Indians who are captured in, uh, uh, in wars. Andrew Jackson didn't hold military commissions for Indians. He famously tries in a kind of uh, 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 summary commission of sorts to British nationals in Florida in 1818. But in that same campaign, he captures multiple Indian leaders, and he just executes them. And they don't produce, that doesn't produce any controversy. Uh, so, so, but now we see military commissions, formalized military commissions for uh, Indian soldiers, um, uh, uh, for Indians, whether they're soldiers or not, uh, on the official view. Um, we start to see the Lieber Code discussed with respect to campaigns uh, in, in the American West. And so what are we to make of that? What do we make of that? Well, on one hand, it seems like it's the extension of law to this formerly lawless, notwithstanding my earlier point about the passions being shaped and views being shaped, but nonetheless lawless terrain of violence. On the other hand, it appears that it's not constraining the United States. It may instead be enabling the United States. It's allowing for perhaps much larger scale executions 
because it's providing some kind of legitimating process. Uh, the Libra text doesn't make it difficult to uh, engage in the kinds of violence the United States wants to engage in in the West. So that's the difficult place of the laws of war in American history uh, and in this book, which is it's legitimating and constraining at once. It does both. It couldn't be what it is without both of those sides. Uh, and you see that in the Indian context. John, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.